Lesson plans are where we translate curricular goals into intentional instructional practices. But it is easy to make lesson plans centered around teacher actions rather than student learning. And so, student-centric lesson planning should not begin with the question, what or how should we teach? Instead, it would begin with, what do we want students to learn? Every teacher should be willing to adapt his or her practices in the classroom to achieve the ideal student learning. That is regardless of what is in their lesson plan. We believe that students are all unique and different and not one group of the same kind. So let's discuss how we can think about each student's needs. In an ideal scenario, we would constantly look at data from prior assessment, check for understandings and student backgrounds. We'd use this data to adapt our planned curriculum to be able to individualize learning. But this is very difficult to do today. It requires us to redesign our institutions and make lots of technological progress in curriculum planning. If you have the ability and support to do this, all the power to you. What should the rest of us do? Let's figure it out. We've all been in a classroom as students before, so we know that at any given moment, there are some students who are on the beat with everything the teacher is saying. And some are miles ahead, getting bored waiting for the rest of the class to catch up. The rest are struggling either a little bit with different issues or grappling any piece of the whole thing. Having said that, how much someone struggles depends on the subject and the teacher teaching it. In that ideal scenario, you'll personalize the curriculum to every student. But outside that, differentiating your curriculum to similar groups of students can be effective. Differentiating means changing something about the curriculum or instruction to better serve the needs of different students. Here we aren't referring to students with different physical and learning needs. They typically need different learning pathways. For the rest of the students, we usually want to avoid differentiating at a course or unit plan level. We also shouldn't change the competencies or assessments for different students. Instead, we may change something about the activities during the lesson. The something could involve the materials they engage with in that activity, how they perform the activity, or what they produce at the end of it. We will look at an example very soon. We change such things so that all students in the classroom move forward together. Differentiating begins with grouping students based on your knowledge of similar learning characteristics in these students. There's no scientific precision to the process. Begin by thinking about the students at the edges of different learning characteristics. For example, pace, level of independence, or level of competency on the expected work. Using this, you may be able to determine what this grouping of students may look like in your class. Don't limit these characteristics to just performance. Include things like attention, engagement, and student preferences. There is a problem that can arise with activities that are either teacher-led or only teacher-performed. The problem is that many students become very passive and disengaged from learning. These are often the students that are not the highest performers in that subject to begin with. So, such activities are where the gaps between these students and the high achievers widen. But you could argue that you need to introduce a lot of core content to students. And activities with Socratic or inquiry-driven methods are not that easy to do, especially with the time constraints that limit you. One of the small things you can do is consider what students are doing when you're doing something. It would be nice if your lesson plan structure was more helpful in making them student-centric. I'd like to share two ideas on how you may do this. In the first idea, you can aim to make most lesson plans have students produce something at the end of the lesson. The product they make could be anything, a piece of writing, a presentation, a journal entry, responding to a handout, anything. You should decide what works best for your subject. When you make sure this is something students have to do at the end of the lesson, an interesting thing happens. You naturally begin shaping your lesson in a way that makes students independently showcase their learning by the end. And you move away from lessons that are only a one-way sharing of information from your side. I highly recommend this. And especially if you want to drive inquiry-driven learning in your classroom. The second idea has to do with templates. 
In this, you pre-identify activities and sections that support the model of education at your institution. And you bake these right into the templates you use. Let me explain how this is relevant to our discussion on student-centered learning. Let's say you're a fan of models of education where students take ownership of their own learning, like the Montessori model or constructivist approaches where students' environments shape their learning experiences. Then you're probably interested in moving away from lesson planning that makes you the leader of the instruction. Templates can help push you in the right direction. For example, the template on constructivist lesson planning has sections like criteria for success and guided practice support and management. These can encourage you to prepare the right environment where students know what is expected of them and how to ask for help. 